Hi, I'm Dr. Mimi Guarneri, and I'm thrilled to be part of Take Control of Your Diabetes. I'm so happy to be talking about heart health because as a cardiologist, I have dedicated the last 30 years of my life to keeping heart patients healthy. Now, I didn't begin my career with a discussion of prevention. In fact, I began my career as an interventional cardiologist, which means I was placing over 700 stents a year inside of arteries. Now, we do great work in intervention, but it's the prevention and the transformation of your health that I'm interested in. So despite all of the great work that we do in the ICU and in the cardiac cath lab, and we're great at handling heart emergencies, we still know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in men and women globally. But what's more important than that is we also know that cardiovascular disease is preventable, and it's preventable through lifestyle change how we live our life. And the same is true uh, for diabetes, for high blood pressure, and so on. One of the epidemics we have right now in the United States is obesity. And if you just look at this map from 2015, for the first time you see some states that are purple in color. That means 35% of the people living in those states have obesity. Those states in red are 30% of the population meeting the obesity definition. Why is this a problem? And how did we get here? Well, we know that one in 10 adults has diabetes. Uh, if we look at the world, it's over 10% of the world's population. Uh, we know that we're seeing a rise in what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is like having insulin resistance in the liver. These are consequences that we're seeing every day in our practice. We know that blood pressure is intimately related to cardiovascular disease. And what many people don't realize is a normal blood pressure for most people is 120 over 80 or below, not 130 to 139, which is already stage one hypertension. We also know that heart disease is linked to where we have our fat. For example, some of us have extra weight in the midline. Some of us have extra weight in the subcutaneous tissues around the buttocks region. So for example, uh, the shape of a pear for many people can predispose to diabetes and to inflammation. We call this extra visceral adipose tissue. And what's important about this as it relates to the heart is that tissue can produce inflammatory uh, cytokines. These inflammatory cytokines can not only cause heart disease, but they can also cause cognitive decline. And inflammation is linked even to Alzheimer's disease. So even just having that extra weight can affect how we feel. We also know for the first time now through the language of science that this chronic inflammation can affect the brain it actually can cause what we call cytokine sickness, which means that inflammation can lead to depression and fatigue and just feeling like we don't want to get out of bed in the morning. So when we think of the heart and we think of the blood vessel, we know that every step in the laying down a plaque in an artery, what we call coronary artery disease or vascular disease is linked to this process of inflammation. And we now know that inflammation is a consequence of diabetes, of being overweight, and as you'll see in a few minutes, a host of other things that we often don't think about. So many people talk about cholesterol 
And I just want to say that cholesterol is important for the heart. Uh, we need to look at the types of cholesterol that people have. For example, people with diabetes in particular may have LDL particles that are very small and could be very aggressive. People with diabetes might be prone to have larger particles of VLDL, which are filled with triglycerides. So sometimes uh, we don't just look at the total cholesterol. That's just a small piece of the puzzle. We want to look at all of the lipoproteins so we can determine what is the true risk, including a genetic protein called LP little a, which can cause cardiovascular disease in very young people. So my patients taught me that the L in LDL is lousy cholesterol and the H in HDL is happy or good cholesterol. But we now know that there are many components of this and it's important to check all of them. So when we think about cholesterol as a risk for cardiovascular disease, we think about particle number. How many of these LDL particles do I have? And do I just have too many LDL particles? Both of these can place us at risk. And if our good cholesterol, our HDL, if those particles are low, that can place us at risk as well. So when we think about cardiovascular disease, we're thinking about lipids and lipid particles. We're thinking about blood pressure. We're thinking about inflammation, even carrying that extra weight in the midline. And we're thinking about all the causes of inflammation. And of course, one of the big ones is diabetes. So we know now that those small particles, even if we just look at the LDL number, and the LDL number is the same, the small particles are much more aggressive. So what I'm saying is you can have the same LDL, but be at a higher risk from having small particles. And that's a common consequence of some forms of diabetes. Well, here's another form of inflammation. And this is why I say to my heart patients, let's get you to the dentist. Inflammation in the mouth can cause inflammation in the whole body and be a risk not only for cardiovascular disease, but also for cognitive decline, arthritis, and other problems as well. Here's another one that we frequently don't think about, heavy metals. Lead, cadmium, mercury can also be a cause of inflammation and vascular disease. And for the first time, we're starting to see how even persistent organic pollutants in our environment, having pesticides and herbicides on our fruits and vegetables can worsen insulin resistance and is linked to diabetes. So making sure we purchase a produce, that's what we call the clean 15. Uh, we make sure we get the dirty dozen, uh, which have a lot of herbicides and pesticides. We get those organic. And here's another one, air pollution. So when we think about the heart, we don't just think about cholesterol, we think about blood pressure, we think about diabetes, we think about heavy metals, we think about herbicides and pesticides, and air pollution is now declared an independent risk factor for stroke and cardiovascular disease. So in conventional medicine, we say, let's take all of these health challenges and let's give medication for them. What I like to call poly pills for poly ills. If you have high blood pressure, I'll give you a pill. And if you have uh, diabetes, we can give you pills. And I'm not against taking medication, but I want everyone to think this way. If someone says to you that you have a health challenge, if they say you have high blood pressure, or if you have diabetes, or if you have uh, depression or any challenge, arthritis, whatever it is, high cholesterol, I want you to say, why do I have this? And then I want you to remember the image of a tree. You know, this is how I teach it to my patients. I say, if you have a tree and the tree has some sick fruit, what might you do for the tree? And my patients will often say, I would give it 
miracle grow, or I would give it more light or give it more water. So I invite you to think about the soil, the soil in which we live, just like the tree has soil. And for those of us, uh, when we're thinking about diabetes, we think of things like macro and micronutrients. That's part of our soil. What are we eating? Are we getting the micronutrients like magnesium that we need? We think about physical fitness and physical activity. Am I staying active every day? We think about sleep. Do you know that people who sleep less than seven hours per night are more likely uh, to be diabetic? And sometimes that sleep is related to sleep apnea. And then we also think about other things like stress. Stress raises cortisol and cortisol raises blood sugar and raises blood pressure. So how we live our life are we sleeping? How are we eating? Are we getting our micronutrients? All of these things interact with our genes and ultimately determine if we're going to stay healthy or we're going to face a health challenge. So remember, what is the cause of my quote unquote new diagnosis? Can I get to the underlying cause and can I fix it? So I think of lifestyle as the greatest intervention. As a cardiologist, I use plenty of medication and we have great medications in various, uh, for various cardiac conditions, but we also have lifestyle. So let's begin with that. A long time ago in cardiology, we heard about a study called the Lyon Heart Study, which was a study that looked at the Mediterranean diet. And this study was conducted in people with heart disease, and they found that 70% reduction in overall mortality and over 70% reduction in heart attacks. Well, that stopped everyone to think, wow, maybe nutrition is as important as we thought it was. This is a more recent study. It's called PREDIMED, which was a Mediterranean diet with lots of extra virgin olive oil and nuts, two good fats, particularly good fats for diabetics. And what they found was that the reduction in cardiovascular disease in the PREDIMED study was 30%. These are fantastic numbers because there's not a medication really that can give this to us. So we know that you may be born with a set of genes that may be predisposing you to something. There are genes that predispose us to high blood pressure, genes that predispose us to uh, diabetes, genes that predispose us to obesity. But we also know that if you place those genes in the right environment, we may not develop those diseases. So our genetics is not our destiny in this situation. I like to think about it as I have my genes, but my lifestyle washes over my genes and I can make a choice about my lifestyle. So I'm going to give you a couple of little pointers that I give to my patients about nutrition. Uh, the first thing I would like you to think about is adding more plant-based foods to your diet. I want you to eat the rainbow and you can see the rainbow right here in this photograph. We know that adding more plant-based foods decreases the inflammation we talked about as much as by 32%, lowering the risk of heart disease, lowering the risk of stroke. So let's get a rainbow of food on the plate. And let's find a way to have these things in our house so that we're less likely to reach for things that are not healthy. So I tell my patients, let's stock up on the good stuff, green leafy vegetables, right? Uh, lots of broccoli and cauliflower and kale. And I love to munch on those uh, little snap peas. I think they're great and radishes and celery. All of these things are low on the glycemic index. They're good for you and they're healthy. Nuts and seeds, I love to have those around the house as a terrific snack. And I tell my patients to get ready for the week. If you're working, you may want to pre-cut your veggies. 
all right? Uh, you may want to buy some of these things in bulk. And for my diabetic patients who want to do a little bit of baking, I tell them you must choose a flour that comes from nuts, like walnut flour, for example, as opposed to a wheat-based flour or almond flour and so on. So lots of tricks that you can do uh, to not only stay healthy, but to improve your blood sugar and your heart health. Uh, these are just some of my favorites. I mean, I love to have my patients make chia pudding and add some nuts or make egg scrambles with veggies and avocado. And for my patients that don't eat eggs, I have them make tofu scrambles with veggies and avocado. And I hope everyone is monitoring their blood sugar uh, with a uh, monitor so that they can see the impact of food uh, on their blood sugar. And I think uh, everyone would find that eating green vegetables, nuts, and avocado is a great way to go. Maybe making a protein a smoothie. And I like to make green uh, drinks because then they don't have all the sugar of lots of fruit. Just small amounts of uh, low glycemic berries on occasion, uh, but it's really not necessary. Unsweetened almond or coconut milk, a nice pea protein, add some fiber in like chia or flax, and throw in a bunch of greens, uh, and it can be absolutely delicious. Add some ginger, uh, add some lemon. Uh, I add cardamom to my smoothies, or you can add cinnamon. Of all the things I can recommend, my favorites are the green leafies. And you don't have to eat these raw. You can make them with some garlic and some spices. You can add them into your lots of big salads. Uh, you can add pine nuts and olive oil, arugula and basil. Try to get those greens in. Uh, the reason being that greens are filled with what we call phytonutrients. Magnesium, for example, which lowers blood sugar. Magnesium lowers blood sugar. Remember we talked about micronutrients. Well, these are your micronutrients, and we get many of them from green leafy vegetables. And this list could be huge, but I just put some thoughts in there to make some low-carb substitutions. For example, use avocado uh, instead of butter, which is, which is not necessarily the favorite fat for a cardiologist. Use organic tofu instead of uh, beef, for example. Let's get some green veggies instead of starchy veggies. Like I tell my patients, I really would rather you not eat the white potatoes and the acorn squash and all of those uh, winter squashes, all of those starchy veggies. I'd like you to go with the green stuff and the cruciferous veggies like cabbage and arugula and kale and broccoli and cauliflower because they are just low in, there's no sugar there. They fill us up, they lower our cholesterol, they're just terrific. And then big salads, why not add some nuts and seeds uh, to a salad just to spice it up a little? And remember, nut flours instead of wheat-based flours. And those are readily available right now uh, just about in all the supermarkets. And we don't have to skip on dessert. One of my favorite desserts, which is actually on my website, uh, where I have some of my uh, educational material for my patients is avocado mousse. Just like having chocolate mousse, but it's made with avocado. Or unsweetened yogurt topped with some nuts and seeds, maybe a few berries, or some fresh berries with a little bit of cream. Uh, lots of things that we can do, including uh, making some greens for dessert. So uh, we don't have to feel like we're giving up anything. We're just making healthy substitutions, which, by the way, uh, give us a lot of energy uh, and feel quite good. And I just want to remind you, when you get invited to go to a potluck or to someone's home, make sure there's a dish that you can eat, including maybe bringing your own dish if you have to. If you get invited to a restaurant, Look at the menu before you go in so you know how to make those substitutions that are right for your nutrition program. 
and always plan ahead for restaurants, for parties, for the holidays. Take control of your nutrition program because that ultimately leads to taking control of your diabetes. And the last recommendation is love uh, because uh, change really requires us to love ourselves enough to do it. To say, you know, my body is my temple and I'm going to start to take care of my physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual body. So be gentle with yourself, take a step at a time, and before you know it, uh, you will have made major, major changes. Now, one of those areas that's not talked about a lot in medicine is this concept of stress. And why it's important is stress has a profound effect on our physical well-being. It can raise our blood pressure. It can raise our blood sugar. It can raise our cholesterol. And we all know it can cause us to not sleep at night, give us muscle spasm, give us headaches, and sometimes even cause stomach upset. So stress is a big one because when we're under stress, we produce a lot of hormones. And the three main ones are adrenaline, which is that speed hormone, that one that increases our heart rate when we get nervous, aldosterone, which raises our blood pressure, and cortisol, which raises our blood sugar. So this is just a reminder that no matter what's happening in the world, stock market could be going down. We can't control that. What we control is our response. And it's our response that has the effect on our body. If we get anxious and upset, we're going to produce those stress hormones. And when we produce those stress hormones, our sympathetic nervous system is surging, our blood pressure goes up, we put weight on in the midline, we develop more diabetes and insulin resistance, our cholesterol goes up, our blood pressure goes up, and even our blood becomes sticky, making us more prone to have a heart attack. And so as a cardiologist, I spend a lot of time with my patients looking at how they respond to the world and what they can do to transform that response. Because we know as our cortisol goes up, we start to see things like osteoporosis, loss of our muscle mass, increases in our blood sugar, more weight around our midline, and we call this aging. So the same things we see with aging, we see from high cortisol. And this is something that we can control. So at the end of the day, stress can affect every aspect of our well-being, including it hurting our bone density and making us more prone to osteopenia or osteoporosis or heart attack and so on. So we all need to take our inventory and say, hey, how am I responding? Am I a hothead? Am I yelling? Am I depressed? Uh, and what can I do to get the help that I need? Because that may be what's causing you to make some decisions about food choices and so on. We know the genes of longevity are affected by stress. For example, moms who are under stress when pregnant have shorter telomeres. That's one of the indications of longevity. We know their babies have those short telomeres, which means shorter life, well into young adulthood. So stress is even affecting babies in utero. We know that racial bias can impact the length of telomeres and therefore the length of life. And we also know that people who have shorter telomeres with cancer have a higher mortality rate. So transforming our stress response is fundamentally important. And we know that research shows that mindfulness-based stress reduction improves telomerase. The telomerase increases the telomere length. We know that transcendental meditation reduces the risk of heart attack, stroke, and sudden death by 48%. 
We know that meditation improves our ability to even mount the response to a vaccine. And we know that meditation can improve anxiety. So even the American Medical Association says meditation improves anxiety, depression, pain, quality of life. And if you can lower your cortisol, you will improve your blood sugar. So I'm just going to end by mentioning the concept of spirituality because Florence Nightingale put it so beautiful. She said, the needs of the spirit are as crucial to health as those individual organs which make up the body. We are made of body, mind, emotions, and spirit. And if we eat all the right food, but we're angry and we're seeking revenge, or we haven't done our forgiveness work, or we're not grateful for our life, eating the right foods may not actually help us. And spirituality is not necessarily religion. It's practicing gratefulness. It's practicing compassion. It's finding joy and purpose in life. And I firmly believe that when we find those things, purpose in life and joy, it gives us a sense of increased hope, increased love, increased contentment, and optimism. So, at the end of the day, there are things we can control and things we can't control. We can take control of our diabetes. We can take control of our health. And this is one of my favorite jokes. It says, hey, is this great traffic or what? Thank you.